Like any significant tragedy, if you're, if you're in the middle of it, I think anybody at the Oklahoma City Murrah bombing, anybody who was closely aligned with 9-11, is changed for life. It was a defining moment, I think, for those of us at the heart of it. I don't think you ever get completely over something like that, but when somebody asks me, what's one of the darkest days of your life? Well, that certainly is near the top. That year was a special year for me. Uh, you know, all of those people helped make that special. So the least I can do is, you know, respect their memories, respect, you know, their families, respect, you know, the heritage that they bought into by coming to Oklahoma State and believing in Oklahoma State. Um, you know, the very least I can do is just come back and pay my respects and always honor that. God willing, I will never forget. And my actions, whenever you see me in a public forum, you'll be able to look here and say, he has not forgotten. Um, because they were just wonderful people. Just wonderful people. And uh, <clears throat> it's just, it's just, I hope it never happens to you. Disbelief, shock, grief. It, it was a difficult first several days. When we landed uh, there at the airport in Stillwater, well, they said that uh, one of the planes had some mechanical problems and they went had to go back to Denver. And uh, I didn't think anything about it. Then, uh, probably. 45 minutes after that, I got a phone call from a federal authority and said the plane had gone down and that uh, there weren't any survivors. You know, that night I get a knock at the door and it's Ivan, Jack, and David um, telling me, you know, it, and it's raining outside and they're telling me you need to come to the office when the planes went down. And I'm like, yeah, I know. They told us before we left the airport that one of the planes had some issues and had to go down. And it's like, no, one of the planes crashed. And I'm like, I'm just like dumbfounded. And I look back at Dan's room and it's like, oh crap. And my brother and my husband were sitting there and as I walked in, they turned around, I said hi, and they turned around and looked at me and I knew something had happened. At the same time on the TV, I saw a plane crash. And Dan turned around and said, Marilyn, your, your boys have gone down. And I immediately thought it was my own son. And he said, it's not Brad, but it's your other boys. And I knew then that it was, I think about it to this day, I can see it as if it were yesterday. It was, it, my heart just plummeted. But I can remember Michael Nowhere uh, from our media relations office and I making a list of who we thought could have been on that plane. And we went out in the parking lot and started checking cars. And um, I still have that piece of paper uh, because, uh, you know, if we marked you out, it was a good thing. That meant that uh, we could confirm you were at home. Uh, but if your car was in the parking lot or we knew Bill Teagans was on that plane, uh, we just continued to, to piece it together and, and find out what 10 we had lost. We will remember. And along the way, I've asked myself, what are we really remembering? But Dan and Nate, like I said, my freshman year, they, they helped make my freshman year great. You know, all the success we had on the court wouldn't have been worth anything if, you know, going over to Bennett just was so much fun. You know, Christmas break, um, you know, campus pretty much shut down 
and we have a whole floor to ourselves. There's like nobody on the floor, on the second floor and Bennett on that side. And we're just running around. We had water gun fights in the hallways, throwing water balloons, dumping water on people, chasing people around with buckets of water. You know, basketball players were on the floor. I mean, we just, it was, that year was, my freshman year was probably the, one of the best years of my life. I mean, it was just everything that could have felt right did. You know, we just, everything on and off the court was great. I was at Eskimo Joe's with Bill Teagans after, after a, a game uh, that the Cowboys won, so we're all in a good mood. And our producer engineer, Joe Riddle, uh, was there. And uh, this uh, beautiful blonde student came up to uh, Bill Teagans and said, uh, uh, Mr. Teagans, can I have your autograph? And Bill, you know, the, the way he was, I mean, uh, he was always making fun of himself, but he kind of looked at us with that deadpan look like, look at me, I'm somebody. And, uh, she grabs a napkin and he starts to sign it and she goes, this is great because my grandmother just loves you. And we just started rolling and we never let him forget it. So uh, I definitely tell that story more than just uh, once a year. Once you, once you experience a tragedy like this, you react to the circumstance that is at hand. You know, the more comfortable we got on the court, I think the more comfortable we were with ourselves and what was going on. So definitely being able to get out there and, you know, vent for 40 minutes, you know. <laughs> it, it was just like, those, those 40 minutes on the court were probably the most normal uh, minutes in the course of a week or the course of a day or, you know, whatever it was. Those 40 minutes on the court were probably the most normal because you were doing what you normally did. I think if we really concentrate on basketball and make these guys understand that these guys would want you to do your very best and go and continue to win ball games, and I tried to make the players understand that this could be a healing, a little bit of a healing process if we go out there and really continue to give everything we have. It's a tribute to these guys because this is what they'd want us to do in a lot of ways, how they reacted lifted the rest of the OSU community. And that was a difficult thing because they were under such a microscope. Um, it, would have been, it would have been very easy to just fold the tent and go home. But they, they persevered and I think honored the fallen guys with their courage. I was really proud of them. I mean, after this situation that happened, um, you know, we, we, we played the games hard, you know, we, we made it to the tournament, we didn't, we didn't, uh, you could tell that the, the, uh, the plane crash really affected the tournament, but they still had the courage and the strength to go out there and, and play that game, and even though they lost in defeat, uh, they never gave up, so it, it, it basketball was really a, a big um, key after that uh, accident. It aged him, it pained him, it, uh, it hurt him. I don't know how Coach Sutton did it uh, because he had the entire OSU family on his shoulders. You know, I, I kind of mentioned that I feel like he was our John Wayne through that time, you know. I mean, he had to be strong, he had to be the rock. But I think, uh, I think it, ha it took its toll on Coach Sutton. I mean, can you imagine having to call 10 families and say, you know, your son's not coming back or your husband's not coming back or your father's not coming back. I can't imagine having to do that. And he called all 10 of those families. And, and um, I think it's something that uh, still affects him to this day. You know, the strength that he had, the reserve that he had, the just, I don't know, it was just, it was, Coach Sutton was a comfort to know that, you know, we knew he cared about us, we knew he cared about those guys, and just to, you know, have him steady and, you know, never really wavering through any of it was just unbelievable. Oh gosh, you know, I can't speak for Coach. I know what I saw. I just saw um, inner, inner turmoil. Um, I don't think he ever, he, well, he can't get over it. No, none of us can get over it. It's just, it, again, it's, I go back to you, you get through it, you don't get over it. Uh, 
you know, Eddie Sutton sort of, uh, he sort of aged along with me. I was a, when I first started covering Eddie Sutton, I was a young man. And now I'm getting pretty old and I look at Eddie and he's getting pretty old. And if you ask me when was the big jump for Eddie Sutton to become an old man, I think it was in January of 2001. And I think I mellowed a little bit even in the treatment of players. I was always pretty hard-nosed on players. I mean, because Mr. Ovid was that way and not that, because we always try to treat our players like they were our children. And if you're a good parent, that doesn't mean that you don't get on them once in a while and you try to set them, give them a set of values that will allow them to be successful when they leave your program. But in some ways, maybe I displayed more affection to some of those players after that. I uh, probably didn't yell quite as much at players as I as he did at one time. I know some of my older players would come back when they were those last few years when I was coaching and gosh, coach, you mellowed. You don't you're not nearly as tough as you used to be. <laughs> The cowboy never touches the ground with his hat unless he's been bucked off his mount or unless he is deeply grieved. It's a wonderful memorial and when you look up there and see all those guys, it's uh, I always have a smile because it'll, it'll, it'll make me remember something that was really, we did that was a lot of fun. You gotta stop, it, you have to because cause, it's, to me, it seems like there's always someone saying something to you, like regardless of which, which, which ten it is. Like one is always, you may pass by one and they, and they say something to you, and you, you just have to stop and, and, and just, you know, just listen to what, just listen to what they have to say or just have a moment of silence because like them ten guys put, put their life on the line for us. But time goes on and I see that in the recruiting process. We'll go by the memorial and people will say, now what is this? And I think, oh, did you not know what happened? I mean, in my, my heart's still there. I see it every day as I walk into my office. And every day I look at them and say hi to them and it's there. We don't have a movie like We Are Marshall uh, that keeps everybody attuned to what happened in that particular um, instance. So. I just want them to remember and never forget that tragedy can happen very quickly and when you least expect it, it's when it kicks you in the teeth. And the thing that stands out to me is either deliberately or by happenstance, every team, probably still to this day, when they go into that arena, they look at that memorial, whether by choice or by curiosity. And, uh, and nobody's giggling, nobody's smiling. Not a word is said. It just kind of lets those guys, you know, realize what, uh, what matters for just a few more minutes before heading out to the court. Around this time every year, you know, the, I try and make it back for the game closest to the memorial. And I'll go out there and just sit and look at, you know, all those pictures and read everything. And just, you know, just think for a second. You know, wonder what if, you know, it'd be, I wonder how my life would be different if, you know, Dan and Nate were still here, if Pat was still here, or, you know, uh, just, you know, what, how everything would have played out. So, but then, I, you know, then I think, you know, well, everything happens for a reason. Out of it all, I think we are stronger people, um, and, and we're made a stronger university that that cares more about each other. You, you've learned something from each one of those guys that's on that plane. Whether if you have met them or not, you would learn something based on what they've what they done in their, in their life and their career. Changed me, I'll tell you what it, how it changed me. It made me more aware of how precious life is and how quickly uh, you can be here today and gone tomorrow. I don't think there's any question that just changed me profoundly, just absolutely profoundly, because uh, uh, you can be sort of wrapped up in your work and what you're doing and, uh, 
Uh, you think it's terribly important and uh, then you realize that life is a very fragile thing and if there's anything that you wanted to do, you better do it because you may not have the opportunity in the future. Uh, definitely I don't like flying. I have a serious fear of flying, uh, even though I still have to get on planes from time to time. Uh, I'm a nervous wreck on airplanes. Uh, I can't do it. I'd rather drive. Um, I don't take much for granted. You know, I prioritize the things that are really important. You know, some things you can do without. Some things you don't need. You know, but ultimately, at the end of the day, I want to be happy. I want to make sure my family's taken care of, and I want to know that every day I show my kids, especially, that I love them. Well, I think we've always been a caring group and, and a tight-knit family, but it just made us that much tighter. Uh, you know, I think it's made us all cherish every day uh, a little bit more, but uh, I can tell you there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about Pat Noyes and what he meant to this program or uh, the enthusiasm of Bill Teagans. You know, my last conversation with Bill Teagans, he pointed at his chair and he said, Larry, uh, don't ever let me mess this up. He said, because this is absolutely the favorite, my favorite thing to do is call cowboy games. So don't ever let me mess it up. So I've always, uh, you know, uh, um, taken a little solace in the fact that I think he died doing what he loved. Um, this guy sits on my desk in my library at home and, uh, and every day I rub his back to remember. We're remembering those 10 guys, we're remembering what we did to, uh, to respond to the incident, but I think more than that, we're remembering what it means to be, to be family and what it takes to dig deeply and, and call out the best emotions in humankind.